What do you call a fish with no eyes? Anyone? What do you call a, what do you call fish with no eyes? You call them fish. 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 No eye. Ah, oh, come on, teachers. What do you call a deer with no eyes? No idea. All right. All right, so teachers, thank you for staying. Those of you that are staying, thank you for being quiet. Those of you who are waiting for your coffee. Um, this talk is, um, I, like, I like starting conferences or starting the day with this talk because we all come from different backgrounds. We have different ideas. We have different methods. We have different preferences in the classroom, but we all have the same, uh, the same focus. And that's this idea of, of trying to teach English to all these willing and sometimes unwilling learners. And what we do is really, really good work. And it benefits a lot of people. So I'm going to start with this graphic. I don't know if you've ever seen this graphic. I found it online. Uh, it's from about two years ago. And it's kind of this pie chart of the different languages that are spoken around the world. Now, it's not perfect. Uh, surveying every single language on the entire planet is impossible, almost by definition. But this is what it tried to do. What it said, first of all, is that <laughs> there are over 7,000 languages being spoken today in the world. So these are living languages, not dead languages. Now, of these 7,102 languages, only 23 of them are the mother tongue for 50 million people or more. And these 23 million, sorry, 23 languages are the mother languages for over 4 billion people. So we go from 7,100 to 23, but we are still talking about the majority of people on the planet. Now, the survey uh, includes about 6.3 billion people. About a billion people were left out. Like I said, this is, this is very, very difficult to do. But this is a good starting place. Now, if we look at this chart, what is the most spoken language in the world? Chinese. All right. What is the second most sp spoken language in the world? Spanish. What is the third most spoken language in the world? English. This is very interesting. So if English is number three, why aren't we teaching Chinese? Why aren't we teaching more Spanish? Let's look at this. Now, this is, uh, these are the countries in which these languages are being spoken. And if you look at the very first one with the uh, highest representation, by far we are talking about English. So English has a f an official or maybe unofficial but formal presence in more than 100 countries, 110 countries, followed by Arabic and then French and then Chinese is actually number four and Spanish number five. All right, so this is interesting. If we look at the number of language learners around the world, we can see that 1.5 billion people on the planet are English language learners. What does this mean for you, dear teachers? Job security. You will always have a job. Someone will always want to learn English and you will be there for them. Followed by French, followed by Chinese and Spanish and then our other friends German, Italian, and Japanese. All right, so this is good news for us as English teachers. If we look at the data, who is speaking English? English has an official capacity in 75 countries, spoken in 110, as we said before. It's the first language for 335 million people, but it's being learned by 1.5 billion people, which means it means that we native speakers are outnumbered 4.5 to 1, which is pretty cool, again, for English teachers. Now, 
Chinese, we're talking about Chinese. 4.6% of the world's population are native English speakers, but 16.6% of the world's population are native Chinese speakers. However, 20% of the world is learning English, and only 0.4% of the world is learning Chinese. Put it all together. 17% 17 of the world is using Chinese. Hi. Hello. Hello, everybody. Sorry to interrupt. Just to say, um, there was a problem to know where the other sessions were. So you have now the rooms for the other sessions. If you want to go to any of the other sessions, please do. Um, disculpen que les interrumpo, pero quería mostrarles que las sesiones, las otras sesiones, las salas están aquí mostradas. Okay? Gracias, Joseph. Nah, para nada. And 25% of the world, one quarter of the population on the globe is speaking English. All right. Now, interesting, let's go back really quickly to Chinese. I've been to schools and I've talked to students who all say we should all be learning Chinese. Chinese is the language of the future. Do you ever, do you have that? Do your students say, why are we learning English and not Chinese? All right. First of all, when I say Chinese, what am I talking about? I'm talking about more than a dozen different dialects, okay? And some of them are, uh, work function together and some of them don't. But what is the most spoken dialect of Chinese? Which dialect is, is spoken by more people? Mandarin, all right. Mandarin Chinese. The number of people in China who do not speak Mandarin Chinese is larger than the entire population of the United States. Where are most of the Chinese speakers in the world? They're in China. This is why we're not going to be speaking Chinese anytime soon. Okay, let's move on. I want to talk about, in general, the benefits of learning a second language. Not necessarily English, but uh, English is a good choice, as we'll see later on. We're going to see a lot of different functions, a lot of different benefits, but I'm going to start with the cognitive functions. This is a pretty good list. So, first of all, better memory. Good, right? What are we really good at remembering? Those of us who speak more than one language, we're good at lists. And we're good at sequences. Does that make sense? It makes total sense. As language learners, we spend a lot of time memorizing lists. Lists of vocabulary words. And sequences. A sequence is a pattern. A pattern requires structure. What do we do in language learning that requires structure? We spend a lot of time learning grammar. So this makes sense. Improved focusing on important information. How many of you have ever answered a comprehension question? Uh, right. Comprehension questions make you look for information. Do you do skimming exercises or scanning exercises in your class? Do you listen for gists? Do you listen for specific information? We practice these skills as we learn another language, so we're good at kind of sorting through the unnecessary stuff to focus on what we find as necessary. Faster, more efficient, flexible brains. This is kind of cool. Let's do a little exercise. Can you read this? Can someone, what does it say? Sí, sí, es cierto. Esta oración está muy mal escrito. All right, it's kind of stupid, right? It starts with a number, the letters are out of order, but your brain still figured it out. All right, we'll bump up the level of difficulty here. This is in English. All right, intelligence is the ability to adapt to change. This one's worse. We have a bunch of numbers mixed with letters, but your brain could still figure it out, right? Ooh, still figure it out, right? Okay. Um, we're going to put these three together. I have a trigger warning, making sure there are no problems. The next slide, does anyone, is anyone here a zombie? 
No zombies? This is a zombie. Okay, trigger warning. You have been warned. All right, the picture of a brain. Zombies like brains. All right, basic biology of the brain. We have gray matter and we have white matter. The gray matter controls things like muscle function, sensory perception, your seeing, your, uh, your hearing, decision making. It controls your emotions. Learning a second language, any second language, what it does is it makes your gray matter denser. It, it, uh, it constricts it and makes it harder, actually, in a way. So you're physically changing that. Now, the white matter connects the different parts, these nerve cell bodies, different parts of the brain to create communication among brain, the nerve cells and the brain cells. Learning a second language strengthens the tissue of the white matter. So just by learning a second language, you are physically, literally strengthening your brain like a muscle, although the brain is not a muscle. And what happens? You have a stronger brain. What does that mean? It's healthier, it's faster, it's more flexible, but it's also more resistant to damage. And we'll talk a little more about some examples with that later. So how many of you were forced to learn English? You had no choice. <laughs> Your hand went up really fast. Uh, I'm, I live in Mexico, and uh, that's where I work, and that's where I was a teacher. And uh, in Mexico, there, you don't have a choice. You just have to learn English. But because of that, those students, they have healthier brains, stronger brains. So that's always a good thing. And there's your brain when you're not looking. That's what he's doing. All right. Let's come back to the list. Better multitasking. Uh, your students especially, but maybe you as well, your students think that they are great multitaskers. They're like, yeah, I can listen to music and do my homework and watch TV all at the same time. Do they do that? Do they say that? Yeah. Are they good at it? No, they're bad at it. Uh, do you want a, a great example? Have you ever been walking behind someone and then they started reading a text? What happens? They're like this, right? And you're walking behind them and you're like... Doo. We've been walking since we were like, what, two? And you still can't walk and read a text at the same time? That would be basic multitasking. And we're not good at it. But we are really good at it at a subconscious level, at an unconscious level. Think about when you started learning English. When you started learning English and your teacher would ask you to speak or your parents or whoever, you had to consciously think about these different things. You had to think about uh, objective vocabulary, correct or incorrect vocabulary, boy or girl, for instance, or neither. There is a right answer or wrong answer. You had to think about subjective vocabulary. Do I want to say that she is pretty or do I want to say that she is beautiful or I want to say that she is gorgeous or do I want to say that she is effervescent? I don't know. All of these other things you had to also think about. And again, when you started speaking English, you were thinking about these things consciously. Uh, your teacher hopefully would help you with things like intonation and maybe uh, rhythm, volume, paralinguistic features. These are things like facial expressions, gestures. But now, it depends on your level of English, uh, you do these things much faster and without thinking about them. But as native Spanish speakers, you don't think about these things at all. But your brain is still doing this. So your brain is multitasking at an absurd level, all these different things happening. Uh, I, if, if we think about my situation right now, I am doing all of these things on an unconscious level. My brain is also moving my feet for some reason, probably to help cure some nervous tick that I have going on. Um, uh, all these, uh, I'm trying to remember facts so that I can present the information to you. So my brain is doing this and I'm not thinking too much about it. So, uh, so our brains kind of working like this. 
Uh, we are uh, faster, not by, by working on this multitasking, we actually become faster at doing diverse activities, which is really good. Again, this is all for learning a language, learning a second language or a third language. Let's go back. Delayed onset of dementia and Alzheimer's. Uh, this is pretty common information. You, we can't, you can't prevent uh, Alzheimer's yet. We can't do that. But studies show that people who are bilingual or multilingual have a delayed onset of Alzheimer's by an average of 4.5 years. And if you think about when in our lives most of us have to deal with that, it's, you know, it's towards the end. So having more years of lucidity is actually a really nice thing. Double the chance of recovery from a stroke. These are great things. This was a study done by UK and Indian researchers in India. And they, what they did is they, uh, survivors of strokes, they gauged who made a full recovery. And what's in really interesting about this is that it didn't matter if they were smokers, if they had diabetes, if they had high blood pressure, and it didn't matter how old they were. 40% of the bilingual stroke survivors made a full recovery. 20% of the monolingual survivors made a full recovery. So your brain, again, resistant to damage just from learning a second language. This is a good list, right? It's worth learning a second language. I got more. More! Higher scores on standardized tests, especially reading, vocabulary, and math. And most of us know that there's a, there's a cognitive relationship between learning language and math. So that's not really a big surprise. <laughs> more resistant to conditioning. What is he talking about? What does this mean? In this situation, as a, as a multilinguist or bilinguist, um, you are better at not allowing people to persuade you against your will. What you like is to receive the information, to process it, to evaluate it, to think about it, and make your own decisions. So if you think about things like advertising, we are less, uh, we succumb less to the persuasiveness of the advertiser. You know when this is really, really useful? Campaign season. All the politicians are trying to tell you this is the truth, this is what you want, and as multilinguists or, or bilinguists or whatever you are, you are better positioned to receive information and evaluate it on your own. Pretty nice little attribute here. Hello. Uh, now we have to sit and look at a Big Mac. Do, 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 do. No está funcionando. Okay. Ta-da! No. <laughs> Are you getting hungry? <gasps> Here we go. Uh, better decision-making skills. Um, this is, it doesn't need a lot of explanation, but again, having the benefit of having learned a second or third language, we are good at uh, evaluating information and coming to a conclusion on our own. Greater perception to surroundings, again, is a little, um, uh, is, is clear. We understand we are better at describing our situation, being in the situation, and also talking about it after we have left the situation. This is an interesting one. Better spending habits. Uh, I don't know if I have better spending habits. But studies have shown, this is what studies have shown, is that people who speak, uh, has anyone gone to Las Vegas? Anyone been to Las Vegas? No. Uh, do anyone been to a casino? Casino? All right. In a casino, what happens? You go in and you, you give your money and they give you these chips, right? those chips. And what happens? You, you're playing, you play games, and it's really fun, but because you're using these chips, and they have colors, and they look nice, you kind of forget that you're playing with your own money. They're not free. They weren't a gift. They're your money. 
And when it's gone, your money is gone. So studies have shown, this is interesting, but studies have shown that people who speak that more than one language are less susceptible to this, um, this misunderstanding between symbolic money and real money. Is this, are credit cards your money? Is it real money? Yeah, you have to pay the bill. The stock market, is it real money? Is it your money? Yeah. So the studies show that the people who speak more than one language don't have a problem making these connections, whereas monolinguists sometimes have problems spending because they don't associate these symbolic forms of currency with real currency. All right, interesting. And then finally, easier to learn more languages. How many of you speak three languages? Was your third language easier to learn than your second language? Usually people say yes. Uh, in my experience, I would make mistakes in my third, I would, learning my third language, I would make mistakes in my second language and not in my native language. But your brain is, has learned that process of language learning and it makes it easier. And for people, and it gets actually exponentially easier. If you learn a fourth language and a fifth language and a sixth language, things get, get uh, simpler. All right, so those were cognitive benefits, personal benefits of learning a second language, more authentic travel experiences, and the ability to understand other cultures and histories. The example I used to use in this presentation, uh, it has changed. So I'm going to focus on this little country that I know called Mexico. Has anyone been to Mexico? All right. Like four. All right. So has anyone seen the movie Coco? Oh, okay. Do you, do you cry? I cry every single time. And I watched it with my mom for the first time for Christmas. And I was like... And she was like... Ooh, and I was like... Ooh. Anyway, so uh, in, in Mexico, it's, uh, let's say that you travel to Mexico. You travel to the city of Oaxaca, or you go to uh, Campeche, or you go to, um, um, shoot, what's the other state? I'm, uh, Micho, uh, nah, forget it. Um, and you, you see these images, and you see people dressed like this, and you don't know what's going on. And you're like, ah, I've arrived in hell. I don't know what these people are doing. But again, ha knowing Spanish is going to help you understand at, in a deeper level the traditions uh, of this holiday of Day of the Dead and why people dress like this and why they, they do things uh, at the, the cemeteries more. I mean, people can explain to you in English what it is, but in Spanish you would, be, you would have more access to more details and more understanding. Uh, also, if you are travelers, Learning a second language is way beneficial. What do you notice about all these signs? First of all, where are they from? They are from airports, right? And what do you notice about them? Every single one. Two languages. Additionally, all of them are also in English. So it doesn't matter what language you speak. If you can speak a second language, traveling is going to be easier for you, but if you speak English, it's going to be incredibly more easy for you. So it's a good thing to know. Uh, appreciation of works of art in their original language. My friends in Bolivia, who is this handsome man? Thank you. How many of you read a book by Gabriel Garcia Marquez? Thank you. I asked that question in Mexico, and unfortunately it's we're farther away. Now, I have read 100 Years of Solitude. Notice I said 100 Years of Solitude. I did not say Cien Años de Soledad. I read it in English. Did I have the same experience? It is possible I had some of the same experiences, but what, what makes that book so special and what makes his other novels so special is not just the story, which is very, very unique, but it's the way he uses the language, the way he uses the Spanish language. And that's something, reading it in another language, I completely, completely miss out on. How many of you have read something by one of these authors? 
Do you recognize them? All right, I'll give you their names. Again, it's the same situation. If you read Shakespeare, is a perfect example. Because Shakespeare, in addition to writing really interesting stories, developed the English language and created words, created idioms, created phrases that we still use today. If you read Romeo and Juliet in Spanish, you miss that aspect. You read a good story and maybe the translation is very interesting, but you miss this whole cultural historical idea of what Shakespeare did to the language. So being able to appreciate works of art, if you go to the opera and you see the magic flute and you don't understand German, it's a different situation. You understand just a little less of why Mozart wrote uh, the way he wrote for that language. Uh, if you, you know, other types of art as well. So learning a second language helps you understand that better. Better at considering someone else's perspective. This I love. There was a study done in 2015 by developmental psychologists in Chicago. And they were looking at children ages four to six from different linguistic backgrounds. And this was the activity. They wanted to, to, to measure the child's perspective. How did he look at things from different points of view? So some of the children were monolingual, some of the children were bilingual. This is the situation. In the room, there was a child, there was a table, and there were three cars of differing sizes. There is also an adult in the room. Now the child could see, and the child understood that the adult was unable to see one of the cars. It was very clear. Now, the adult asked the child, can you move the small car for me? Now, this is the adult's perspective. This is the child's perspective. What happens? What do you do? What do you move? She said, can you move the small car for me? Overwhelmingly, the monolingual children moved the smallest car because that was the car from their perspective. It didn't matter that she couldn't see it or he could see it, that was the small car. However, bilingual children adopted the perspective of the adult and moved what was the smallest car from that perspective. It's kind of fascinating, isn't it? So you think about being able to, what that means is you learn another language, there's a lot to, to take in with regard to, you know, what you hear or orally, but also uh, the perspective, the context, the situation of the speaker. So four, five, six-year-old children were already being able to, to look at things from different points of view. It was pretty amazing, I think. All right. And let's continue. Increased open-mindedness is kind of piggybacking off the same, this, sec, this other idea that we can see uh, why people think or feel the way they do and understand that. Uh, fun <laughs> enjoyment. I don't know. How many, of you, how many of you learn English because it was fun? All right. Pretty good. And a sign of respect. I know here in Bolivia you have a lot of different indigenous languages. In Mexico we have literally thousands or hundreds. I don't know. Um, and so this is a nice quote from Nelson Mandela. He says, if you talk to a man in, in a language he understands, that goes to his head. But if you talk to a man in his language, that goes to his heart. So for, uh, as a sign of respect, for instance, being a non-Spanish speaker, my coming to Bolivia, if I didn't have the Spanish background that I have, uh, you know, learning to say thank you or learning to say hello in a native language is basic but it makes the listener feel that, that, that you are appreciating their culture and their language as well. Okay, let's change topics just slightly and talk about English specifically. So this whole first part was about learning any second language and the cognitive benefits, the personal benefits um, that, 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 it, that gives us. But English specifically, uh, here I have a little video clip. I don't know, do you recognize this guy? Uh, this is a, a clip from uh, the TV show, After Friends. I want to thank my friends at NBC 
for letting me use this very short clip. Uh, and uh, we're going to see Joey. And he's going to start, uh, he's going he's gonna to sit in a second, English for a second, as a second language class. But Joey already speaks English. So I don't know. Why does he do this? Let's see. Oh, there's no video. There's no audio. No problem. I'll be right here. Oh. <laughs> nice to see you again, Maria. Hello, Mrs. Laferty. Oh, welcome. What is your name? Uh, I'm Joey. Joey, you have a wonderful accent. <laughs> Thank you. Joey, this is an English as a second language class for beginners. Are you sure you're in the right place? Oh, I'm in the right place. Let's get started. I hope that everybody practiced counting to ten oh, over yeah. the weekend. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Great. Let's do it together. One, One two, two, three, four. Eleven, twelve. Very good, boys. <laughs> Somebody's gonna get a gold star. Thanks, thanks. Thirteen, fourteen, fifteen. <laughs> oh. School, Renata, they go to school. Okay, Joey, why don't you pick it up where Renata left off? Now, this is a hard part. So take your time. Oh boy, yeah, this is this looks tough. Uh, the bell rang, and the students all went to the auditorium with their teacher. Boom! <laughs> That's right, Boris. You heard it. Auditorium. I am so lucky to be with the smartest boy in class. Some words are so tug. Tug. Oh, remember I told you the G H sometimes sounds like an F. It's Tough, like rough, or laugh. Oh, Joey, make love to me to knife. That is good English. Okay, like everybody, to take out their homework on the subjunctive tense. You didn't do it? I got it. If the present tense of the verb to be is I am, then the subjunctive tense is if I, Joey. If I was. Oh, I'm sorry. That's not correct. <laughs> it's a uh, if I were. Very good, Boris. <laughs> Joey, you're stupid. <laughs> Joey is stupid, Renata. <laughs> All right, so, so we all have our, our reasons for learning a second language. We have reasons for learning English. Joey had his reason for attending a second English as a second language class. Um, but <laughs> English, why would you want to learn a language where you could say things like, I chopped a tree down and then I chopped it up? Or... Is this sentence grammatically possible? Had, 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 had. Yes. Yes, it is. All the money that he had 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 no effect on the situation. Or... Will. Will, 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 wills, will. It's a stupid sentence, obviously. But it's grammatically sound. There are no problems. We have a couple people named Will. We have a couple usages of the, of the word Will as a, as a noun and as a verb. But it's possible. <laughs> How about this one? Uh, can you hear it? 
a doughy but tough plowman walked through the burrow, thoughtfully coughing and hiccuping. We have all these different pronunciations of these four little letters. Such a tricky language, English. All right, why bother? Why learn English when it's so complicated? Why Eng when English has more than a million words? By far more words than any other language? Well, like it or not, uh, English is the official or unofficial language of these areas in our lives, in our society. Uh, international affairs, global trade and commerce, diplomacy, all these international relations. The World Bank put out a study that said uh, countries where English is spoken or English is uh, important are countries where it's easier to do business. There are businesses based in non-English, non-native English speaking countries, Renault and Nokia, Samsung, but they have a corporate language. The language is English. So doing business uh, and working internationally with people is usually more successful these days in English. Now, why is that? It's because of our friends uh, from, uh, from the United Kingdom who a couple hundred years ago decided that there was nothing left for them in Europe. So they got in their boats and they started colonizing. And at some point in the history of the world, all these sections that are in red were part of the British Empire. So if you had ever heard this saying, the sun never sets in the British Empire, this is why, because it goes around the whole world. So for this reason, we have the opposite of the Chinese situation where China, Chinese is located, uh, localized, I should say, in China, English has been spread around the entire world, even though there's only one country called England. All right, so if we get back to these other things, the internet, uh, about, let's say, 15 years ago, m more than 70% of all the information on the internet was in English. So you had the internet available to you in other languages, but you had a lot less. Today, that number is different. It has dropped, but it's probably around 50%. 50% in English means that 50% of the rest of what is on the internet is spread among all these other languages. So for you or for your students, think that you want to do research, you want to look things up online. If you know English, you're going to have a lot more resources available to you. Computers, obviously, computers have their own language, but usually when new technology comes out, the manuals, the, the descriptions, or the... the um, the, the way that the, the computer text talk to each other usually is done in English. Science, uh, it doesn't matter what country most uh, scientists are from, if they're um, physicists, chemists, uh, whatever scientific field they work in, if they publish, they usually, in, an, in a journal, they usually publish in English. And what that does is it makes the information more accessible to more people. If you have a Dutch uh, physicist published in Dutch, well, only the people who understand Dutch will understand what he or she is writing about. So they have adopted English. Tourism, I think that's self-explanatory. The example we saw from the airport, a lot of uh, signage, a lot of explanation for tourists is done in, ed in English. Education, uh, so many of these higher learning institutions around the world that are considered at the high level are in English-speaking countries or uh, maybe are in non-English-speaking countries but still use English. In the United States, we have many. Obviously, in the United Kingdom, there are many universities, but also Australia, uh, New Zealand, Canada, things like that. Uh, movies, books, popular music, whether you like Lady Gaga or not, uh, or uh, Harry Potter, a lot of the entertainment culture is in English. So, so there it is. And then we have some occupational areas where English is required. If you want to work uh, as, a f as a pilot in international air uh, travel, you have to know English. You do not have a choice. Uh, I live in Mexico. I flew from Mexico to Panama, from Panama to Santa Cruz. And those are three speak sp Spanish-speaking countries. The pilots still communicate in English. They still the cabin talks to the passengers in Spanish and in English, um, so it is necessary for some, for some work areas. 
Now, speaking of that, there are these benefits, these occupational benefits of learning English as well. Uh, again, it makes you more adaptable if you change location, if you want to move to another country and still work. If you have a business but you want to attract tourists who do not speak Spanish, they probably speak English. So that will help you. Uh, if you work for a corporation, obviously having English skills because of the, uh, what we talked about earlier, international affairs, commerce, having English skills is going to help you. Uh, and like we said before, with air traffic or air control, whether you're um, uh, flight attendants or your ground crew, we do need English skills. So knowing English makes you more, uh, well, it makes you more hireable, actually. It's easier for you to get a job. Often you're paid better as well. So that's a nice incentive to your students who don't understand why they have to learn English. All right, so why did we study English? Why did I study English? Think about that. If you had a choice, what was your specific reason? Things have changed a lot in English language learning. If we go back decades, almost, almost a century, and we think about English learning at that time, if you study methodology, you study methods, you, you know the progression, and you know that things are very, very different now than they were then. Back then, we looked at a native speaker as the goal. I want to sound like a native speaker, uh, whether it's someone from the United Kingdom or someone from the United States or wh whatever that is. And this had these weird effects, these adverse effects. First of all, we divided English very specifically into British English or American English, which we still do now, but we are starting to erase that line between them a little. And we got very, very strict in the classroom. Okay, we, we want to sound like uh, someone from the United Kingdom, we want to sound, sound like from the United States, so we're going to eliminate Spanish from the classroom, we're going to read literature in the, their mother tongue, and we're going to study their culture as well. And we want to emulate that. This is what uh, the, the, the situation was, again, we're talking many, many decades ago. And things have changed, honestly, in my opinion, for the better, what we are trying to focus on now is being an English speaking or English knowing bilingual or multilingual. So you can proudly say I am Bolivian, but I function in English. Or I'm Mexican, or I'm Czech, or I'm Ukrainian, but I have English skills. And like I said, we're going to try to incorporate this idea of a more global English, uh, not divided so strictly by, by dialect. Uh, understand the varieties of English, try to incorporate them, understand that we all have the same goal to communicate, allowing the usage of our native language in the learning process. Okay, I'm not going to shun Spanish. I'm going to use Spanish if I need to, to try to help me in my communication needs, whether it's learning or communicating. Uh, reading English lit I when possible in English, but tr uh, translations if necessary. And then this has a nice also benefit, this idea of not idolizing a foreign culture, but seeing the, the importance of that culture and then looking at our own culture and saying, yeah, but, you know, the, uh, the United States culture is very interesting and, and very diversified, but you know what, they do this there, and in Bolivia, we do this, and our culture is really interesting and diversified too. So we incorporate uh, this idea of culture into language learning, which is uh, one of the tenets of CLIL. I know there's some talks about CLIL uh, in the next couple of days. Really, really interesting. I, honestly, my personal opinion uh, is that this is really a great thing. All right, so model English teacher, a uh, native speaker or fully competent non-native? This is a very interesting conversation. Uh, as a native speaker, I've been on one side of this coin. As a teacher, uh, many teachers and learners, and then I had to put, and their parents, today, still prefer a native speaker model. This is something, as a teacher, that, that has happened to me, where students would come in and their parents would say, uh, I want a native speaker, or they would ask for me specifically because they knew me. Eh. Uh, the thing is, and I, I shouldn't say this because, because many of us here that are, that are giving talks are native speakers, but there are some disadvantages to being an English teacher as a native speaker. 
Uh, we are limited often by our local, lone local dialect, and we may not be aware of international usages. I'm from the United States, and I, in the school where I was teaching in Mexico, I would often do uh, like Cambridge prep classes. I would do a PET class or a first certificate class, uh, and those, that type of English is very British. Uh, and so there were things that I didn't know, things like idioms, uh, maybe some vocabulary. And that's because I'm not subjected to it as an American. And so that is one of, my, one of the disadvantages of being a native speaker. Whereas non-native speakers learn this global English, they understand that there are different types of vocabulary words in British English and American English, and that's okay. Uh, they understand that they say some things, pronounce some things differently or say uh, different uh, words in different languages. Uh, but you also have, I think this is really, really important, you have this advantage of being a role model. I am not a role model for anyone. They look at me and they say, well, obviously he should speak English but they look at you as a Bolivian and you speak English and they say, wow, that's really impressive. Your students look at you and they say, wow, she, my teacher can speak English, but she also speaks Spanish and that's a lot of work and I want to be like her or I want to be like him. No one wants to be like me. I don't want to be like me, but uh, this is pretty cool. So don't, you know, never underestimate that. Okay, here we go, getting to the end. In summary, the advent of English as a lingua franca, as this command of this language, this uh, default language that we go to in many areas of our society. First of all, a change in the concept of what English is. So an internationally comprehensible variety of the language, not just a single native model. So incorporating all Englishes into our learning. A change in the goal of English teaching. We want to produce competent English-knowing multilinguals, not native speaker robots. A change in the image of the English teacher. Being a native speaker is less important than your linguistic competence, your teaching competence, your intercultural competence. And then finally, this idea of incorporating the cultural background of your home country into an English course. So yeah, it's great to learn about what they eat for breakfast in uh, Wales, but let's talk about what we eat for breakfast in Bolivia and how they're different and how they're the same uh, and if the language comes into that. All right, so, <laughs> so in English, we have these jokes about a person walking into a bar or a group of a weird, diverse group of people walking into a bar. Uh, and it's funny. So I'm going to tell you, do you like jokes? Okay, I'll tell you a couple jokes here. A horse walks into a bar and the bartender says, why the long face? Is it funny? Do you get it? If you get it, you should be very proud of yourself because it's only funny if you understand the double meaning. A horse has a visually long face. But what does it mean to have a long face? If someone says, ah, oh, why the long face? What does that mean? Yeah, it means you look sad. If you, if you don't understand that, then the joke isn't funny. And the bartender would never said, oh, horse, why is your face so long? Um, all right, why the long face? Let's try another one. A skeleton walks into a bar and says to the bartender, give me a beer and a mop. Uh-huh. Do you get it? So the skeleton drinks the beer, and then he has to mop it up. All right, that one's less successful. How about this one? A hamburger walks into a bar. The bartender says, I'm sorry, we don't serve food here. <laughs> That's good. All right, here we go. A Russian, a Korean, and a Mexican walk into a bar. How do they communicate? In English, of course. Mm, okay, that's not funny, but, but it's true. <coughs> okay, I'm going to tell you the best joke. The best joke. But in order to understand this joke, in order for this joke to be funny, you have to understand Spanish and English. Are you good? All right, here we go. 
I'm going to tell the joke as I tell it in Mexico. A Mexican man walks into an American clothing store, and I'm going to use the word calcetines. I don't know what word. Do you use medias here, or do you say calcetines? Medias. Do you know what calcetines are? Okay. I'm going to say calcetines. And a Mexican man walks into an American clothing store, and he says, Quiero calcetines, por favor. And the store owner says, oh, I'm sorry, I, I don't speak Spanish. And the Mexican man says, calcetines, quiero calcetines. And the American man says, okay, okay, um, come with me. So they walk around the store, and they get to the section with all these shirts. And he says, shirts, shirts. And the Mexican man says, no, 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 calcetines, quiero calcetines, calcetines. And the American man says, okay, 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 let's go. And they continue, and they go to the section, and they have pants. And the man says, pants, pants. And the man says, no, no, calcetines, quiero calcetines, por favor, por favor. And the American man says, okay, okay, okay. And they keep going around the store, and they, they come to hats, and they go to boots, and they have gloves. And finally, they come to the section, and on the, the hanging on the wall are all these different socks. And the American man says, socks, socks, do you want socks? And the Mexican man says, Eso, sí que es. And the American man looks at him and he says, Eso, sí que es. But if you knew you, what you wanted, why didn't you tell me in the first place? It's good, come on, it's good, right? Now, all right, thank you, thank you, thank you. Now you can tell this joke to your students. And if they get it, that's good, because you have to understand Spanish and you have to understand English. All right, so this, uh, I, again, this is my, my first time in Bolivia. I'm so happy to be here. Uh, I'm very excited. I have a couple other talks this week, so just, you know, come say hi. Uh, there's a lot happening, and thanks for coming. And, yeah. I think I'm done. Thank you so much, Joseph. Now I need your attention, please. I'm going to explain you what comes next because we have some changes on our schedule because of some technical difficulties. Only for today, we're going to move the lunch time to 1 o'clock. And now, the ones who didn't uh, pick up their materials, please, you have to go to the ground floor first floor and pick it up. Uh, once you pick your material, please you have to look for this schedule and you have to choose which level do you want to assist. For example, in, on the ground floor we have virtual classroom and pop-ups presentations. So if you want to, uh, to go to Bob's presentations, you have, you have to go to ground floor. On first floor, we have workshops for institute teachers, future teachers, and also we have the tech village. On second floor, workshops are for secondary, primary, and university teachers. On third floor, we have this auditorium where plenaries are going to take place, okay? Um, once you get your material, you have to choose to which one of those uh, workshops do you want to go? The ones uh, that set a time, 11, we're going to do it right now at 12. So the lunch is going to be at 1, and we're going to continue after lunch at 2 o'clock. Okay? Thank you so much. <laughs>